Welcome to Monday, boys and girls. Are you ready to truck it? I'm Dooner here with Michael Vincent the Dude. Hey, peace and love from a BEA beautiful day. It is in beautiful. Fred Alley. What's going on in my head? I was trying to get like into some uh, spring football over the weekend. Oh, USFL is yeah, back, yeah, yeah. but there was like three people in the audience. You think people <laughs> are, because uh, they try to watch the XFL, they try to launch like the UFL, they've tried to do a few of these things. Yeah. You think people are just like, it's like Netflix. Netflix always cancels the show you love. Do you think sports fans are feeling this about Spring League? I have a couple different theories. One, Miggy Cabrera was hitting his 3,000th uh, hit over yes. in Detroit. Big one. 503, 500 home runs, 3,000 hits, yeah. only seven people. He's one of seven that ever done it. Could have been dads like me, too. Uh, we left her in the middle to go see Sonic that jog, too. And there you go. And, and that's the other. And plus, you know, football widows are not having another season, dude. Probably not. Probably not. <laughs> hey, nah, we've nah. got an amazing show today, right? We've got our video back from our Nicola Trey test ride, that one that showed up in Covenant down the street. I'll also, I'm, I'm back from Austin. I'll talk about my impressions from highly on. We'll talk about nuclear verdicts, what puts what puts them at risk with fleet-worthy solutions. We got in-cab camera tech. Very controversial. Drivers don't like it, but Adam Kahn from Netrodyne, he tells you why you may. Uh, in the path of least is diesel, the path of least resistance for decarbonization. That's what Nick Romer from CBIS 21 is going to tell us. But first, Carl Benzel, commissioner at the FMC. We got to tip the band and we'll get right over to him. Autonomous trucks are coming with a huge potential windfall if you're ready to seize it. Start re-engineering your supply chain today for autonomy. Contact Locomation at, tell them, dude. Hey, go to locomation.ai for turnkey solutions immediately after this show. Now we got Carl Bensley. He's the commissioner at the Federal Maritime Commission. He's joining mm -hmm. us today. We're going to talk a little bit about that Maritime Transportation Data Initiative. I'm excited. Oh, yeah. Carl, okay. yeah. thanks for joining us early on a Monday. Oh, I, I, uh, I'm pleased to do it. I really like your show, so uh, it was... Uh, uh, I've watched uh, quite a few episodes, so it's nice to be with you. Well, we, are, we appreciate that. And the Maritime Transportation Data Initiative, it's something that caught our eye almost immediately. So when your office reached out to talk about it, we were overjoyed. Can you tell us a little bit about what the MT, it's MTDI, right? That's the, uh, that's the acronym we're going with. It, it is. And so, uh, so early in the pandemic, when we started to see these huge surges of cargo going on, uh, it was, uh, I, I traveled around a, a whole bunch of the uh, ports uh, and there was a lot of congestion building up. We didn't have enough chassis and uh, it was apparent that there just wasn't enough communication that was providing information that could be used uh, by truckers, by railroad companies, uh, by people who were picking up cargo, uh, by, uh, by BCOs. So uh, I talked to our chairman and, and, and we, uh, other commissioners had made similar sort of comments about how we uh, should move forward uh, to provide better information uh, to the public. And uh, we created the Maritime Transportation Data Initiative in, in December. And we've been having open meetings online uh, to assess uh, the quality of information that's provided uh, to the transportation industry, uh, to the shippers. And so we've done uh, 15 already. And uh, we're trying to set up uh, long-term standards that can be used by everybody uh, uh, to, to facilitate movement of cargo. Uh, we, we don't have a lot of space at ports, uh, and we need, to, we need to do better with information. Yeah, so, uh, Carl, welcome to the show, and thanks for being on, by the way. Uh, but you, you mentioned that uh, providing data to the shippers, right, yeah. and the quality of that data. What about the, the, um, the trucking and the logistics companies as well? Are they involved with this? Yeah, yeah, we'd like to make it publicly available to everyone. Mm -hmm. So if you're a trucker, you show up at the port, you uh, you uh, you have to f figure out whether the terminal is accepting and empty, or 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 whether you can go in. So we need to do better with every chain uh, uh, in the link in transportation. So yes, uh, and I I actually be, believe for truckers, it's the it's the hardest challenge. Uh, they just mm -hmm. don't have the sort of the port of LA Long Beach has twelve different terminals, and they have, all have different. Uh, requirements for uh, delivery or, or for return of empties, mm. and we need to uh, to provide advance notice about what these uh, policies are going to be, so you can plan your load. Who are the early participants in this? Who's providing the data, and who's the FMC working with? 
So we're looking we're looking across the chain. Uh, so we've got we've had uh, we've had uh, meetings with ocean carriers, with uh, marine terminal operators, with large distribution centers, uh, large integrators, so freight forwarders, uh, trucking intermodal uh, companies, drayage companies, railroads, uh, shippers, BCOs, uh, and so we've pretty much covered the uh, intermodal railroads. So we've covered the whole the whole gamut of uh, of operations. Yeah, so um, Carl, how do you get the the uh, really the power brokers to understand the real importance of what this data can do for them? You know, I think when we talk to everybody, so for instance, if the truckers come in, they'll tell us what they're what they need more information about, and and the terminals will tell us we need more information about this, and they all have information. It's just that they're not uh, transmitting it in a way that's accessible for everyone. So hopefully, everyone will want something out of the information, the data exchange, and as well as being willing to provide it as well. As well. And I think if we get that information, it can help with the efficiencies long term and, and iron out some of the major problems we have at ports. Carl, has there been any resistance in trying to get that, that data? Or are there any privacy concerns or data concerns, like the type of things we always hear when it comes to data sharing amongst multiple parties? Yeah. So we're not looking at cargo confidential interest, like what they're shipping. We're really looking at what uh, happens through the supply chain. So, you know, when when the ship is going to anticipate going to berth, what their schedule is longer term, uh, what the status of cargo in a intermodal t- uh, terminal is, uh, when gates will be open for uh, for the return of uh, empty cargoes. So we're not delving into that proprietary uh, cargo interest uh, area. We're really looking at how do you look at the system and the information that allows the system to work better. So, Carl, will you go past the 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 data and the and the dissemination of that data? Like you mentioned, there's 12 different terminals there in LA, and they all have different type of requirements. And kind of homogenizing that type of stuff for for the driver wouldn't that help the the supply chain to move in and out of there better? I think we'll set up a mechanism for them to do it once you come up with standard elements that are going to be re- required. Uh, so we're we're looking at that, but I think the first step is looking at the the information that should be provided by by whom. You know, sometimes you have multiple uh, parties, uh, and I think that that will lend itself down the line to how do we uh, try to coordinate this better. And I think we do need to get there. We need to get. Uh, a more collaborative approach uh, mm. to allow the industry to do better. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, when you're having these conversations with the different intermediaries in the industry over the past two years, especially, there's been a lot of there's been a lot of frustration. People calling for a forum, seeing what we can and mm-hmm. cannot do, and I, I think shippers are a little concerned too because we're also looking at these China lockdowns. Is that something that we need to be worried about right now? What we're seeing over in China with these these lockdowns? I've heard uh, reports that cargo could be down as much as fifty percent. Well, card goes down, but it's surprising. Uh, you know, we've been able to work. We have such a big backlog of existing cargo out there already uh, that we're basically just sort of working through a backlog uh, that ha- that's uh, that's gigantic. I mean, three years ago, we didn't have any backlog. And now we have 140 ships, uh, East Coast, West Coast. West Coast is getting better. Uh, so, in, in fact, it's been a reprieve a, a little bit to allow us to move cargo. Uh, and I think there will be a wave of pent up demand that will, will be a, a huge problem for us uh, in the uh, uh, summer and, and the fall uh, because the demand is still there. The shelves are lighter than ever and, uh, and we haven't been able to deliver that uh, Chinese cargo. So it's sort of like an accordion, it's opening and closing. And, and right now it's opening a little bit, uh, but I think it'll close again. Carl, you released a report before we let you go, just on chassis. I was just wondering yeah. if anything had happened from the report you released uh, last month about China monopolizing chassis and container production. Has anything gone on from there? We've had some briefings with uh, different people in Congress, and, and we have some scheduled for other uh, federal agencies. I think people are still re- uh, reading the report, but I, uh, people are stunned when they think that 100% of all of these containers that we use are, are manufactured by three major companies in China mm-hmm. and that the Chinese government controls them. And you think about, you know, as a nation, what can you support and do if, if they're in complete tro- control of this, uh, of, of this market? And so we're still working through 
uh, briefing people and talking about it. And so I think we haven't gotten to a point yet where uh, it's resonated enough uh, so that further action would occur from the government at this point. Well, I got to tell you, we're happy that a light is being shown on these different issues Absolutely. and that our agencies that deal with this stuff as well are getting more involved and more recognition for doing so. People who want to keep abreast of what's going on with MTDI, where do I send them to? www.fmc.gov, and we have a couple of link spaces that are there. They can go to my webpage, which is on our website, but www.fmc.gov. Thank you so much for your time today. It's going to take uh, it's going to take some collaboration from everybody. Oh, yeah. So here's no a good first step. It. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah. Keep on uh, keep on with your work. I love your show. There you go. There's a little cowbell Thanks, for, you for saying that. <laughs> Appreciate it. Have a good one. <laughs> Flattery will get you everywhere. Yeah, especially by government officials. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> <Absolutely>. come on. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> All right. We have, uh, we have Mike Presche. He's the CEO and president over at Fleetwood Solutions. And you know what? We haven't covered a good nuclear verdict in a while. We haven't. So our audience hasn't heard us talk about nuclear verdicts in a while. So let's bring him on. He'll get us up to speed on the current state of all that stuff. Excellent. Mike, thanks for coming on the show on a Monday. Thanks for having me. Nice uh, bright room over there. Where, what part of the world are you sitting in today? I'm in Florida today, so it's, it's bright and sunny, unlike Wisconsin, where I live. So. Oh, oh. <laughs> okay. Right. You're still a Packers fan, though, right? You didn't jump to like a, be a Dolphins fan. Never. No. I'm, I'm a true blue Packer fan. So Yeah, you can't, nuke, you, you can't nuke your fanhood, but there can be nuclear verdicts in trucking. Um, for those who are unfamiliar, let's just start at the beginning. What is a nuclear verdict? Why do we use that term? What does it mean? So I think in the industry, it's gotten to the point where we look at nuclear verdicts or verdicts that are $10 million or, or larger, you know, as a derivative of some sort of accident or claim with, a, you know, a motor carrier involved. Okay, so that's a nuclear. So how do these things happen or when do they happen? Yeah, so, you know, most carriers are in a disadvantage. You know, we, we depend on our the trucking companies to keep our supply chain going. And as they, they're driving across the highways, they have big billboards on their trailers and they become a very easy target because when they're involved in an accident, the perception is there's deep pockets when in fact, you know, not all carriers are huge and all the carriers are struggling to how to, how to protect their business because of these nuclear verdicts that are, are showing up over and over again. So I'm a carrier, Jaws theme going in my head, all of these sharks circling around, <laughs> all of these ambulance chasers, they want to hit me with the nuclear verdicts. How do I mitigate that risk? So in our opinion, you, you, you mitigate it before an accident occurs. You, you have to show people that your drivers and your carrier as a whole is very serious about being compliant, keeping the road safe, keeping your drivers safe. So we think it's, it's a process of, you know, uh, working with companies like Fleetworthy Solutions that can partner with their safety departments and give them a single version of compliance truth and a single version of all the historical data that shows that you take compliance serious. Yeah, so there's this thing out there, an intelligent compliance platform, Dooner. Can you uh, uh, give us a little bit about that, Michael? What is an intelligent compliance platform? So our definition, it would be, it, it's, a, it's really built on a three-legged stool. So stool number one is leveraging technology that keeps track of all the different regulatory changes and gives you the ability to visualize how you're doing from a compliance perspective. Uh, there's a lot of companies that are doing that. We add a, a layer of people to build an even stronger moat around our customers. And when I say people, we have our staff becomes an extension of a carrier safety department, uh, constantly understanding what's going on with the regs and making sure that our, our carriers understand the changes that are happening. And then the third piece is data, and there's a lot of data coming out of the cab these days. Um, many carriers don't know what to do with all the data, but you know whether it be plaintiff attorneys or the government, they're getting better at better, better and better at analyzing data to find neg you know negligence, right? So mm -hmm. we want to be able to consume data, put it in a single version of the truth in the cloud, let our carriers be able to understand what's going on from a risk perspective and then turn that data into action. So it's fine to have a lot of data, but if you don't have a, a partner that's telling you what to do with that data, what to do to mitigate risk, uh, you end up being at risk. So how does this work for like the user end? So I'm, I'm using, so like you have an in-house CP suite that is an intelligence compliance platform. So how is that like used in the real world or in practice? 
So depending on what your position, if you're, you're a high level person that just needs to see dashboards on how you're doing from a driver perspective or an asset perspective from a risk profile, uh, we deliver dashboards that easily tell you how you're doing and, and hopefully give you peace of mind uh, that you are, you know, in a, in a compliant place. If you're not a compliant in a compliant place, our technology will review all the driver, all the asset information that's in our solution and trigger tasks and things on a daily basis so that we can improve the risk profile for our customer and our and their drivers. Yeah, so Michael, you know, there's there's trucking companies out there that see these nuclear verdicts and see this type of stuff and think, well, man, it sucks to be you guys, but at least I'm 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 fine. How wh- why do all trucking companies need to really take a serious look uh, and need to take that compliance uh, uh, seriously? Yeah, our 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 slogan is beyond compliant. We we say the reason we say that is just getting by uh, when it comes to regulatory compliance is not enough. Uh, mm-hmm. To me, that means you're just one incident away from a potential nuclear verdict. You know, I think that carriers need to understand that there is a, a weird connection between negligence and liability, right? So, you know, a driver might have a very small amount of negligence, but because of the emotional experience that happens when these tragedies happen, there's like this no ceiling from a liability perspective, right? And if, and if there's a belief that the carriers can just handle these costs that just is another derivative or a problem in, in this equation. So we say that the quicker that you can show historically that you've taken compliance seriously, um, the bigger moat you have when it comes to these type of nuclear verdict situations because of an accident or, or something that happened that was out of your control. What do you think the biggest misconception is there about compliance and safety in trucking right now that you would love to see that, that sort of thinking shift? Yeah, I think, you know, I I happen, I'm probably too philosophical, but I think in general, people forget that the the person that's behind that cab or that that steering wheel in a big truck is just like all of us. They're doing a job. It's a really important job, like we saw during the COVID pandemic and the drivers being on the front line and trying to make sure that the rest of us could live our lives as well as we could. So I think there's this misconception that once you get into a big truck, you're part of some big company that has deep pockets. Mm. Um, And that's just not the case, right? Um, Very rarely do you see carriers that that don't care about, you know, the health of other people on the road. It's a highly regulated industry for that reason. Um, And I think that gets lost once you get into an emotional situation in a trial and, and so on. That is a solid, solid point. And before, and earlier you mentioned the, the data, and you need to get control of that data because the plaintiff attorneys are going to get a control of that data. Is that a point that really needs to be driven home, that there is all this data out there? If you're not discovering it, somebody else is going to. So you need to get a hold of that and be compliant, right? Absolutely. And you have to be able to get all that dispersed data. And, you know, what we are pushing for is to have a single, a single version or destination where you can look at that data horizontally, see what trends are. Are happening and kind of red thread things so that you can come up with a strategy to mitigate risk, right? Um, so that's what we do at Fleetworthy. I have a great staff of people that are passionate about that. And, you know, our ultimate goal is just to make sure that roads are safer and that our drivers that, that are working for carriers, that our customers of ours can get home safely. All right, hey, we like it. You know, one thing that Hello. really stuck out to me too is We've talked to a lot of insurance people. We've shot, mm-hmm. we've talked to insurer tech sure. people, and I believe you are the only one that spent so much time talking about driver impact and the driver's perspective on what actually happens here. So I want to give you a little cowboy button, commend you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, where do people reach out and learn more? So you can reach our website at www.fleetworthy.com. Uh, Thank there's you. a plethora of information on that website, and uh, we hope to hear from your audience. Well, thank you very much. Enjoy that Florida sunshine, and thanks for coming on the show today. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Michael. Good stuff. You know, I mean, like that, that really, I, I liked his, he said I'm getting too philosophical, but I really liked what he had to say. We don't get that perspective out of a lot of people. No, we really don't. At he, least on that side of the space. A, a, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I really appreciated that as well. It was, uh, it, it was very insightful. Yeah. Adam Kahn, president, Netrodyne. Let's talk to him a little bit. This is a little bit controversial. Mm -hmm. In-cab cameras, eye of Sauron, or are they helping the driver's behavior? Can they help the carrier? (laughs) Let's get into it. Adam, I believe you come from a trucking family, if I'm not mistaken. Does trucking run in your blood? 
Yeah, I'm a, I'm second generation uh, trucking. My father worked for Ford Heavy Truck for 35 years, and he was uh, he was one of the resources that was responsible for moving from cab overs to uh, aerodynamic vehicles, so you could actually see people in front of the tra- uh, the, um, the the tractor itself. So um, you know, I grew up with Ford patches on my on my knees and uh, you know trucker hats before they were uh, fashionable. <laughs> well, I, had my, I like it and uh thank you Ad- ashton kusher i think he brought those back uh way back in the day yeah he, he did, he did. <laughs> well you know it's it's like it's like the cap you have on but mine had you know the tl 2000 or the tl 9000 you know lit logos on it so yeah no i've uh i have some ford blue in my in my blood yeah absolutely <laughs> well, then you know drivers drivers like to be independent right they don't necessarily want a camera watching them at the same time we just talked to a guest about the devastation of nuclear verdicts and the power of data and the power of video in these type of accidents so there's got to be some ground in the middle maybe here tell us a little bit about if they're necessary or not what's our cameras are well, you know, it's interesting. So I was listening in on the, on the previous uh, interview a little bit, and, and there's this little climb that happens, right? So you have, uh, you know, the plaintiff attorneys who came out and said, hey, you guys don't know what happened. You're going to pay. Then we, uh, the industry came back and said, no, we have data. You know, we know what kind of happened. And then the plaintiff attorney said, well, wait a minute. Uh, you can't show me what happened, so now you need video. So the next ask that's happening is the plaintiff attorneys are coming back and saying, well, we don't care about video anymore. We want to uh, have a microscope on your safety culture. How often are you talking to drivers? You know, are, are, do you have the right SOPs when you have a driver that needs some coaching? Well, the new ask might be you should talk to your drivers once a week. Now, if you have drivers who are on the road for a month at a time, that becomes really problematic to balance the amount of time that you talk with a driver to uh, satisfying or negating some negligent claims. So as an example, one of the things we did with the internal camera, there are many fleets that uh, like the camera itself because if there is an event, then they can see what the driver was doing and say, my driver had his hands in the right position. He had good eye position. He had his seatbelt on. He wasn't distracted. I can remove the driver from that event as quickly as possible. And those are stressful events. You know, you get into a, a, a at fault or a not at fault accident. And, and, you know, it is a very, it's a career changing event. But if you can quickly go through and tell the driver, hey, I saw what you were doing. You're good. You know, here's some video you can share at the scene. Sit tight. We'll be there in 30 minutes. You know, there the internal camera has, you know, a real use case. But not every fleet, not every driver wants to have the camera, you know, recording inside. Mm. So one of the things that we did is we applied some machine uh, learning technology that says I can watch the driver and make sure if they're distracted, I can send them an in-cab notification. Please put down your phone. I don't need to collect video. I don't need to send video. I don't need to save video. So if you have a driver force that's a little sensitive you know, or a little, uh, they just don't want to be, you know, cast and say, hey, you're watching me all the time. But the other pivot is try to negate that negligent entrustment lawsuit that says you're not talking to your drivers enough. I think there is a good mix of, of where technology has evolved to be able to provide the driver with some frictionless coaching along the way, slow down, uh, put down the phone, uh, create some space. Uh, hey, you're drowsy, you know, stop and take a lap. You know, all right. those things are really important that the internal camera captures. But I think there is this methodology that you don't necessarily have to use video, you know, as a stored element uh, for it. So, so Adam, those, all that makes complete sense, right? But it's still, you know, the drivers still have like this want for privacy that's sure. out there, right? Big Brother's watching yep. me all the time. How do you implement with implement it with with them? How do you get their buy-in into this? Because you're going to need that, right? Otherwise, you know, you got disgruntled employees, et cetera. So, how do you go about implementing that? Yeah, I always joke with people that you know, you know, we talked about like the four blood in me that I, I think my blood type might be B positive. Because, you know, a lot of what we did at Netrodyne was lean into the carrot versus the stick. And um, there are, you know, I was just looking at some data with one of our customers. Uh, That particular uh, customer drives about 100,000 miles per year each vehicle, which is about 500 minutes of driving. 
this particular carrier, this driver pool, 92, 93% of their time driving was exactly what you know, the fleet asked for. You know, it's compliant driving. And those are positive elements that you can share with the, you know, with the driver and saying, hey, instead of the old model where I would tell you you had five minutes of unfocused and things went bad and, you know, I'm going to cast this shadow of you being a bad driver, I might suggest leaning into the 92, 95% mm -hmm. of where you know that the driver did well, start the conversation on a positive. And in addition to that, because of uh, some of the technology that we have, we can start to track where drivers are proactively um, responding to unsafe acts and, and record those as very, very good events. We call those driver stars. I might tell a fleet when they roll out their program for the first 90 days, only talk about driver stars. Envy mm -hmm. is a huge, is a huge balance where you have a hundred drivers in the room. You know, what, what is the better scenario being five drivers on, up on stage and saying, here's my five best drivers, or you have a hundred drivers in the room and you say, these five drivers are fired and get out. You know, now the other 95 drivers go, oh my God, I have to get, you know, I have to be a step away from the blood splatter. So, you know, positive recognition is, you know, and envy are great tools and drivers are competitive. You know, you know, I, I've seen it a lot where one driver will look at the other and say, what's your score? And the driver says, hey, I'm, a, I'm an 875. And the other driver says, well, I'm a 900. Ha, ha, ha. You know, so they, I mean, they, they, they really, you know, they like to, um, you know, joke and, and, and compete with the other drivers. And, I would rather have them uh, joke and compete on positive elements where they're engaged and they're connected versus, hey, I got to make sure I'm not the bottom five or the bottom 10, you know, versus trying to aspire to be the top five or the top 10. That's excellent stuff. And and it, so it's kind of this gamification, right? And that, and that always works, right? Instead of, and because, you know, back in the day when I started, it was, hey, fire the bottom 10 and the other will gravitate towards the top. That was the mentality. This is that. So do you take it a step further rather than just the stars? Do you take it into monetary incentives, days off type of incentives and that type of stuff with the gamification? Yeah. Oh, yeah. We have, we have customers that um, they've integrated into our system and we integrate the score into their payroll system. And this is pretty clever, um, you know, so the, the drivers, you know, there's some science behind the score. The back, end, the back end science is that, you know, if you have a certain score and you're above that score, the probability of an accident, you know, is greatly reduced. For the driver, they don't care about that. You know, the driver says, hey, if my score is above that score, uh, you know, we have this particular fleet I'm thinking about, they integrate the driver score into the payroll and they say, if your score is above 900, we'll give you an extra $50 a week. Now, $50 mm. a week is a lot of money for, you know, certain drivers. So it's, it's yeah. you know, it's, it's free money for just doing your job. But the incentive there is to, you know, that paycheck comes home to your significant other. And, you know, if you're not hitting that 50 bucks, you know, someone else is probably, you know, in your ear talking about, you know, what your next week is going to look for. Sometimes it's, you know, your husband or your wife or your partner, uh, in any of those cases, you know, that might be a stronger influence than than the safety manager, you know, at work that you try to avoid. That's a good point. Sure. But a bunch of data, you take a bunch of data, you stick it in the closet, you don't do anything with it, you're short-staffed, you don't know how it works, any of that kind of stuff. It can be a problem. Um, how do you get people trained to to use and action this stuff and make it actually, you know, make sense to everybody? Well, you know, so I, so that is, a, that is a problem where you, you, you know, you have 100 drivers and you have one safety manager – and the ability to talk with those 100 drivers on any uh, frequent cadence starts to become a problem statement. So that's why one of the things with Driver Eye, we push a lot of the uh, initial coaching in an automated way through audio inside the cab. You know, slow down, create space, um, you know, remember to stop, you know, put down your phone. You know, those are frictionless coaching, which could happen every minute. Now, the, the other elements that are really interesting is to be able to push out self-coaching to the driver where at the end of the week, you can pull together a package that says, hey, driver, you know, here, let's just recap your week. Here's what you did really well. Here's what, you know, you might want to think about next week to improve. Here's how you hit your score or here's why you didn't hit your score. And they click a box, which now says, hey, I've had a conversation with a driver in an automated fashion every minute, every hour, every week. If I need to escalate, I can bring the driver in. So now that burden of that 100, 100 drivers for one person, I would suggest that face-to-face -face now becomes 
you know, uh, you know, I really have to have a conversation with a driver about, you know, their performance or the alternative is what I would highly suggest is that you don't forget about the celebration as much as the escalation, you know, having a burrito, a breakfast burrito with the boss, because you had a great month is hugely motivating. And, you know, it creates a lot of jealousy of other drivers who say, I don't know what Bob just did, uh, but I know I'm a better driver than Bob, but Bob just had a burrito with the boss and, you know, I want that. So I'm going to figure out what Bob's trying to do. And I want to be like Bob, you know, burrito. I, I can almost use mo- <laughs> I <love it. laughs> Adam, 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 I love it. We we're, uh, we're running out of time here, but people who want, who like what they heard, they want to learn more. Where do I send them to? Yeah, check out uh, www.netrodine.com. Lots of information. There's, I would uh, suggest, um, you know, if you don't want to look at the product, there's really good blog and a lot of good articles about industry events and, you know, different ways to approach uh, talking with drivers and working with technology. Uh, and again, it's d- netrodine.com. And uh, my emails, my first name, dot, uh, con at netrodine.com, if anyone wants to reach out to me personally. Thanks so awesome much. Stuff. Take it easy, sir. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you, Adam. All right. Thank yeah, you so much. We, we got to work with cameras on us the whole time. Little, little time. Yeah, and sometimes it's it's embarrassing. Sometimes it is, especially <laughs> when your mic cable falls out. With the growth of Loves and Speedco Nationwide Network, Tire Pass has evolved its delivery method, always meeting the needs of your drivers wherever they may need it, whether in lane at Loves Travel Stops, inside a truck carrier, or at a Speedco service center. On-site terminal, doesn't matter. Doesn't Making matter. Making tire pass part of your driver's pre-trip inspection can inform them of any tire-related concerns. So to learn more about tire pass, where are they going to go? They're going to go to loves.com right after this show. Hey, wake up, Michael Vincent. Transfix is modernizing the way freight moves nationwide. The Transfix <laughs> Intelligent Freight Platform combines a digital freight marketplace, intuitive software, and dedicated experts to drive performance to your modern, not antiquated not dinosaur no. supply chain. Get a free quote at Tell dude. Sweet. Go to transfix.io. Man, we've been covering energy a lot lately. We, you know, we're going to have the Nikola train a little bit. Yeah, we're going to talk yeah, a little yeah, bit yeah. about the Hylion experience yeah. a little bit. We had Chase Barber sure. on from Edison Motors, how he's making that diesel hybrid solution. Well, Nick, similarly, he says, hey, there's a hell of a lot of diesel out there. Nick Romer, CMO at CBS 21. A lot of trucks run diesel. Let's not reinvent the wheel. Phew, there's a couple out Let's there. Let's just diesel. make diesel more efficient. Let's find yeah, out how right. he plans on doing that, though. Nick, thanks for coming on the show. Uh, thanks for having me, guys. It's been a while. Nick, where are you sitting in the world today? Are those Legos behind you as well on that shelf? Yeah, you, can't, you can't go wrong with Lego, right? So, um, all the way from Dundee, Scotland today. Oh, well, right. like you, you know, his bio. So you are not just trying to make diesel more efficient. Your buyer said that in 2010, right? You were an award-winning furniture and product designer. So what was oh. the most badass thing you made? Ooh, um, I think I think what we're doing right now is a bit more badass. We'd probably, oh. we'd probably kick a bit more ass in, in the long run than, than any of my furniture pieces, but yeah. <laughs> okay, all right. He's playing it very cool. Maybe he made a baffing spoon or something like that. Maybe all he did. Golfers Everything I made is. in woodworking was very uneven when I was a... Uh, when I, was, oh, so I never made anything good out of wood when I was a kid. Well, the Siemens elevator pitch, it says a radical evolution of the combustion chemistry in existing compression ignition engines to bring the carbon footprint of today's engines below that of electric vehicles mile for mile. Bold claims. Back them up. How does this all work? <laughs> Back them up. The, yeah, they are bold claims. And the, the main thing that we're doing here is what we're trying to do is not, as you said, let's not reinvent the wheel. There's like millions and millions and millions of trucks out there that are currently running on diesel and that diesel is not going to disappear. The trucks are not just going to disappear overnight. Um, I saw a statement from, I think this, the BMW CEO the other day, where if we stop selling combustion, like fuel, uh, fuel cars right now, like today, it will still take 10 to 15 years to phase them all out. Mm. Just imagine how long it will take for, for trucks. So... You know, and, and the price of these of these beasts is, is not something to, to write home to. So, like, what we want to do is make sure that we that we get the, the moms and the pubs and, and everybody else, and even the big the big companies as well, that we can help them not just become leaner, but like cleaner and leaner at the same time. And that's something that we've been promoted for like the last couple of years. Yeah. So, Nick, what are the what are the benefits of of of, of this technology? How how does it how does it work, and and what are the results? So the 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 biggest the way we always say it right. So um, when I when I speak about layman terms, when I sometimes speak to other like people, like when when you have a big bonfire and you throw a big log, 
like, you know, a timber log on that fire. That's just going to crisp on the outside, right? And then tomorrow morning you come back and that, that log is still there, just charred on the outside. That's the same as when in, you know, diesel combustion. Like the black smoke you see is just unburned diesel. So what we do is I kind of like we chop the diesel molecule up in like tiny little pieces. So, you know, get back to that uh, analogy of like the bonfire. Let's get that tree trunk again and just chop it up in tiny pieces and tiny splinters, throw down that bonfire and everything will just burn up. So that's basically what we're doing. So is this a like a device you would attach to an engine? Is it a whole new engine? Like what what is the sort of product here? No, it's a, it's a retrofit, and the the, bit, the that's the that's the quality and the probably the, the benefits of what we have. It's a, it's it's a simple installation installed in under two hours. We tried to get it in under an hour, but like right now it's in under two hours. We we install it. It's a retrofit. Only has a couple of pieces, a couple of elements to it. Um, and then it's the main thing is the, the driver, which which kind of talks to to the engine, um, uh, to, to the onboard engine, and knows how much because we we use gas um, uh, as as a small injection, which is less than five percent, like around four point seven percent. So it's a retrofit, easily installed, uh, widely available, um, and when when it's installed, it comes with three huge benefits. Um, right now, nobody has escaped the, the fact that, like, when we when we go to the pump, it will charge us. I don't know, like, up to like, was it five dollars? Like, I don't know how much it is right now. There over here, it's it's in pounds, and we're sitting at almost two pounds, which is which is absolutely ludicrous. Um, so it will reduce your your fuel cost um, because it burns more fuel. It, it, it cuts the, the fuel up, so it burns um, less fuel. So therefore, the fuel cost come down. Therefore, your emissions get cut, um, so your CO2 emissions and your NOx emissions, and that's from the get-go, from the moment you turn on your engine. And then the lastly, but not least, is kind of as a byproduct, your maintenance cost will, will dramatically be reduced as well, because it, it gets burned slightly cooler, because so, you know, the engine doesn't get so hot. So, 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 Nick, if I'm understanding this right, you're, you're burning more of the fuel as it comes through, but therefore you're using yeah. less out of the tank in order to get more energy out of it. Does it improve your MPG and, uh, as well, your miles per gallon, and, and does it improve yeah. the energy extraction out of the fuel as well? 100%, yeah, so it does. And we've even had some initial trials where people, like, on the, on the test range, People thought we had like put a turbo on the on, on, on the truck because it, it, it kind of released more energy as well. So yeah, be careful on the tr- on the throttle with that. What, what would it cost a fleet to install something like this on their trucks? This is this is always another big bold statement that I say it won't cost you anything. <laughs> it's, we it's almost like you will get money back in your pocket. That's the way we see it. Um, Yes, it will cost you. It's around eleven thousand dollars. But like we do a, um, we the way we the way we produce it is kind of like on a lease basis. So whatever you whatever you save on a monthly basis. So we say that on average, um, you would save depending on the the mileage that the truck will do. Your return of investment of that, and especially in this current climate, will be between eight and ten months. Very very cool. So. Would I get any benefits though, like zero emissions type of benefits or fleet type of credits or any carbon credit, like any of that kind of thing for installing something like this? Yeah, so the, the carbon credit uh, is a big thing right now, and especially in NOx, that get, just gets hammered down, especially in the US right now as well. Over a year in Europe, is the same thing. Um, you know, the CO2 is something that we've been seeing for years, but the NOx emissions has always been kind of left to the side, although the NOx emissions is, is the killer for human, human beings. So, um, you know, therefore, like NOx is something that's definitely going to get cut further and further and further. And, and trucking industries and everybody else, they, they just get pressurized even more so to reduce their NOx uh, emissions. We've already seen it with Amazon lately, to be honest. Excellent stuff. I got, so do, does this work with the, uh, with the alternative diesel fuels, like a biodiesel or the renewable diesel or anything like that? Or, or do you need to adjust differently for that? No, so like um, the the product, and uh, like any any diesel, any type of liquid gas, um, you know, is is both of them will work. Um, we've used a couple, we trialed a couple of biodiesels, um, 
the same the same with like normal because the diesel um the way that the way it's kind of like put together like here in Europe as as America, the slight variations. So yeah, and then you've got HM, uh, HMO as well. Like these, these kind of um, these kind of elements, like deep, they work and all. Cool. Shall we go to the Some wheel of stupid? Yeah, he's second time. Wheel of stupid questions for sure. See what it lands me. on. Anywhere it goes, oh, whoever oh, knows. Oh, this what is a good got? one. This is a great one. What is the trashiest song to play at a wedding? Ooh, the trashiest song you can play at a wedding. Uh, um, oh, give me one. That um, it it must be. All you need is love. There you go. All you need is love. Oh, all you I, need I, is I love. I forgot who. Like, <laughs> wow. You get that one here. I don't know. That's enough. Okay. All right. He hasn't been to many trashy weddings. We've been to. We've been to trash here. Yeah, I don't know if they like have that Buck Cherry there. song, that crazy B one. <laughs> that's up there. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. up there. What would you play? What would you play at the wedding? The trashiest one? Yeah, what's I, I don't know, but I I played uh, talking shit about a pretty sunset at mine actually. Yeah. Well, having like the, so the girl trashy, she did just odd. The bride she sang crazy B H yeah. herself walking. I think like walking maybe for a down man the singing, aisle. like for a man singing closer by Nine Chanels, that could be a little. That could oh, be a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nick, in the meantime, people who want to reach out to you, where do we send them to? Um, you can send them all the way to Scotland if you want to, if you want to run the goal. But um, if you want to do it virtually, uh, either on LinkedIn or go to our website, www.cybers21.com, or my email, which is nick.rumor at cybers21.com. Nice. Right See, and I called it Sebas. I have this uncanny knack to mispronounce every single like, awesome. word I haven't heard out loud before. I so love it. I'm going to pack up my baffing spoon Cybus. and head on over and play golf with Nick. <laughs> all you need is love, Michael Vincent. Sure, that's thank, it. Thank, thank you, Nick. <laughs> Thanks for joining us today. We appreciate it. <laughs> awesome yeah, stuff. Take it easy. All right. So about uh, <laughs> not last. What are you laughing about? <laughs> Our show. We'll get to that in a minute. Last <laughs> Friday. So not not last Friday. The Friday beforehand. We um, well, actually the Thursday beforehand. We saw on LinkedIn. Right. Matt McClelland up the street from Covenant was uh, prancing around with. He a, was prancing. Eh? He was the actually Nicola prancing. Trey. He was parading it around like yes. it was a, like a Budweiser Clydesdale or something. <laughs> he was. And we said, you know what? We've had a few things to say about those Nicholas, but we're not going to be haters, right? No. If you say that there's a BEV Nicola Trey in town. And we can, you know, go for a ride along in it. Hell yeah, we were there. Here's the video. We're there. (laughs) That is not me playing that music. This is a song I don't want to play at my wedding. (laughs) (laughs) The whole time, just on a loop. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) Do you think Trevor Milton would be a good wedding guest? Yes. I think he would. (laughs) I think he would be excellent. (laughs) But you have to warn the bartenders. I think. So this is a drone shot right here, and I believe hey, this is from... And the dude oh. here with oh. Matt McClelland. We're right here at Covenant in Chattanooga, and a real curious item has showed up in their parking lot. It's a Nicola tray. There it Matt, is. Matt, tell us what we're looking at here. So this is one of the very first cab over. <laughs> well, it is the first cab over in the United States um, since, what, 1984, I think? when BJ and the Bear went off the air, yeah. right? The Kenworth K-1000, <laughs> was that the last one? I think it was. Yeah, so cab overs are now a thing. So this is uh, Nikola Trey. It is the first battery electric truck. There's actually a lot of other OEMs, guys, that, that, that have a battery electric trucks, but this is the first one for us. Now, I noticed something. So you mentioned the cab over. I also noticed that this is a day cab. Will this be used more for like Dre, local type of operations, or what do you have planned? So length of haul, about 300 miles. Yeah. Uh, so that makes it a day cab. So we're going to be using it. We're going to deploy it at a customer in Atlanta. They're going to use it maybe 80, 90 miles a day. But, you know, because of all that traffic in Atlanta, that's about all you can go. So it's just driving around in a big circle. Starts and stops at the same place every day. Charging station is going to be right there. Our driver already loves it. I just got one question. Yeah. What does it transform into a transformer? Oh, gosh. You got to ask my 16 hard hitting question. <laughs> I don't even know one. The yellow one. That's it. <laughs> bumblebee. Yeah, bumblebee. Yeah. 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 Sounds good. Primal over here. Why you did know, there's he been a lot say about bumblebee? Nicholas. Should actually see how it drives? I, don't, I have no idea. It's I think yellow. that would be a great idea. I don't know, man. Maybe All right, they're well, we actually paint. got in this thing. I think All right, so we're here sitting inside a Nicola Day Cab, a Nicola Tray for the first time ever, and I'm joined by this gentleman over here. Who are we talking to? Johnny Pritchard. Everybody around the shop calls me JP. So you're going to show us how this all starts up and how it works? Okay, you your digital display here. This is basically all just like a car starting button. You get your push button starter. Touch it one, it lights up, says accessory. Put your foot on the brake no, pedal. No air start. Hit it again. <laughs> See, it says starting up. 
it goes green, it's on. Now how does the ride handle? Taking the tight turns and everything, how's that treat you? This thing rides smooth, very, very smooth. It will it'll turn on a dime. The weirdest thing is when you're moving too, I mean it's kinda of understandable when you're not, but like you, you, you miss that engine rumble, right? Like yeah, if that's different. That is different, it takes a little getting used to. That it's is that super is smooth though. It's it's I, I imagine if you took the decibels inside this cab versus your you know your standard diesel day cab, you're talking about significantly more quiet just running. Yes. So in terms of speed, what kind of pickup do you have on here? What's a zero to sixty? And have you uh, topped this bad boy out? I plead the fifth. <laughs> <laughs> DJ, thanks for the test ride in this Nikola. You know, I was a little bit of a doubter. I, I heard all the stories about Nikola, but now that I've been in one and I've seen how it moves, I can see why Covenant's decided to take one of these for a try. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's very good. A lot of customers are requesting, a lot of things they're asking about, and coming technology, what's going to happen? So, like I said, we, we have been haters on this thing. Sure, We've been made sure. all the pushing jokes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We made him go uphill. We yeah. made him go downhill in we the did. Uh, we did in the truck. It was, uh, it was a smooth ride. It kicks right off the line, right? When he pushes that hammer down, you just you, you, you quarter tore. quarter throttle. My head went. Yeah. Oh, nice jump. I think you got a little bit more elevation than the last time did I get we some did elevation? one of these jumps. All so right, cool. I've been working on it. All right, I'll I'll. I'll I'll, I'll give you my review first. So my breakdown is this. It's cool that they're getting the BEVs on the truck. A lot mm -hmm. of them seem to be locked in this 250-mile yes. range. If you saw what yes. Matt said, they're using this for 90-mile loops. Very quiet, runs well. I mean, yes. it's, it's an uh, Iveco truck, right? And, mm -hmm. and the technology from what we, we saw, at least, the battery technology seems sound enough. Yeah. Here's the negatives. It's kind of a beta pilot. Um, sure it is. I think it's only really for the big dogs right now. Yes. There are charging issues where yes. um, if you can't connect to the grid, you have to have this big portable charger. It's yes. not the kind of thing that you're going to roll out massively on a fleet now. And I think people right. have to understand that too. And maybe retail investors don't always do. That, you know, they're expecting a little bit more progress, a little bit more quicker from these companies. Agreed. A large part of that test is the charging part of it, right? And yeah. the grid being able to handle it. There's that other side of it as well. Love the truck. Comfortable. It was fast. It obviously has quick low-end torque right, right there ready for you to go. It was beautiful. Doesn't have the pull chain. Don't like that. But uh, yeah, and, you, and you're right. It is a beta test and people want this thing to go, oh, and it's great and it's green. Well, that's not exactly where we're at right now, right? Well, you, I like you need that some you time. I like that you mentioned the interior. It's very spartan in there. Yeah. Um, there's nothing that's really going to confuse you. I think most drivers could drive into that truck sure. and, and they could just drive that thing. Sure. No, no problem whatsoever. But a couple things. They didn't have the pull chain for driver experience, right? No air yeah. horn on there. Very disappointing. you got to disappoint kids if you're going down the highway. The other thing that was really disappointing to me was that it had a built-in um, ELD. ELD system. Um, we weren't with Nicola, mm. so we weren't with a Nicola rep. JP's a driver for Covenant. Covenant was hosting the whole thing, so it wasn't like we got a bunch of, like Nicola talking points or something. No, 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 we didn't. Us. So, yeah. but we also didn't get a ton of questions like that answered because of the nature of the visit. Yeah, exactly. Um, I know that a lot of drivers probably would not love that the ELD goes in there, and there would also be some data concerns. Why can't I swap in my own, e my own ELD? Yeah, that, that that I didn't realize that portion of it, but yeah, that's kind of a drawback. Yeah. But it's out there. But I mean, like it's a beta, also. It's a beta, it's, and that's what I was judging it is. And hey, they got one on the road. Yep, they do, uh, and it moves. So I went to Hylion. It, fortuitously enough, Hylion had reached out recently too, and they were they told me to come down to Austin, Thomas yeah. Healy, didn't he? Said, hey, I want to show you our Hyper Truck ERX. The Hyper Truck, unlike the Nikola Tray, Nikola Tray, fully battery electric vehicle, yeah. 250 mile range. I should also mention that with that Nikola Tray, you're adding about ten thousand dollars in weight and about one hundred fifty thousand dollars in price. So. Swallow that for me. Yeah, it's like 29.5 is the yes. weight. <laughs> so their, their solution over at Hylion, the Hypertruck ERX, uses CNG and an electric motor, and the CNG generates energy for the electric motor. Yeah. So that's the concept that they're going with. Went down to Hylion, got able to see one. I think we have a, a video here. Thomas even let me go up to the engineering team. Let's take a look. All right, let's freak them all out. I love it. Yeah, <laughs> Love it. 
<laughs> that was a highlight of your that, trip. That was a highlight of my trip. That, that had that. Unlike the Nicola, I actually got to drive this truck. Uh, oh, not on the nice. highway, but in um, in their lot and everything. And I was really? able to like with up other quite a bit. things you could hit in the There lot? was a driver who took me out on the uh, highway. No, there was oh. no cones or there was other vehicles I could have hit in the park, really? like stationary ones if I really wow. wanted to. Okay. Um, we have a couple more pictures of it too. You can take a look at this. It's what their solution is. They're putting on an American truck, a Peterbilt, right? Yep. And yep. on a yep. Peterbilt, yep. Uh, yep. that Peterbilt frame. Again, another truck you can seamlessly walk into. It's an automatic, but you get in there. The only like addition that a driver would have to deal with is like this little tablet that shows the readout of the proprietary highly on system. By the way, Tom is a big dude. I'm 6'2". He's like 6'5", 245. He's a big human being, isn't he? He used to be a punter, too, for some reason. <laughs> well, to get a torque with those legs, bang! Well, you know, yeah. some people were cracking on me, and they are saying that my, le my, my leg is up too high on there, but I'm using science here to prove that it was not. Now, if you look no, at this... No, you look... Per that's what I was laughing I about earlier. Distract. I reeled down and saw that picture. I was like, if, what is if this? If you look at my foot position, and, and you look at Riker here, my... My foot no. is not above my kneecap, and no. that is not foul. If it's above your kneecap, you're committing a foul. If it's below the kneecap, you're perfectly fine. I, I think what people are mistaking here is your, your knee's in perfect place. Your, it's your, your shoulders are not tilted at yeah. the proper angle. That's what I'm it is. It's going throwing the wrong it off. Way. Yeah, you're backing out instead of leaning into it. Yeah, I'm like, I'm a little teacup, and I was yeah. going the wrong direction. Yeah, yeah with, I think uh, that's what it is. With that arm there, I, I got to... That's you know that's why it helps when you have your own people on set too. Like if you were there, you could have said you know you're leaning. Yeah, because it, it, you didn't. Know. It would have helped though. So yeah. my impressions though, my impressions of Hylion and everything. Yeah. Uh, lot of energy within that company. I'm looking through, and we'll have I'll have a full segment on that. A lot of yeah. energy, but first initial impressions is. I like the feel of the truck. I like the look of the truck being uh, a Peterbilt. I like that it doesn't have that range anxiety because the solution they're using, you're talking about 1,000 miles sure. versus 250. You're not sure. talking about a five-hour recharge. You're talking about, about 12 to 15 minutes to fill a CNG tank. Ooh, that's um, true. You just have to figure out that CNG solution, and if 700 stations work within your network, they did said some of their technology will lead you from station to station, so you can do route planning. Oh, that's planning. cool. And with a thousand miles, I mean, I the only problem is like if fleets have to go out of their way to get to these things, like it's then, in, then inefficient then time use is going to be tough. But there's already, like you said, that infrastructure is there at 700. It's easy to duplicate that other ways if that technology takes off, right? Yeah. So those are our initial thoughts on on the Nikola and the Highland. We'll have more Very on nice. Highland later, and let's get to a little big deal, little deal before we send you home. Big deal. Little deal. All right, here's one for you. Cargo theft increases 18% in Mexico during March, right? The most commonly stolen goods included fresh food, uh, fresh food items, um, construction materials, automotive parts, and electric products. AMIS reported that 7,099 insured tractor trailers were stolen over the last 12 months, but fortunately, 59% of them were actually recovered. Wow, 59% yeah. so were actually recovered? Big deal, little deal. Um... I, you know, I, it's hard to call it a little deal because I, it's hard. I, I think it's a big deal. I think it's a big deal. And, and in, an 18 percent increase is indicative of there's 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 not a ton more volume. Right. Like I looked at Laredo and some of the other ones, 5.74 percent up in volume. So an 18 percent increase in theft is not just because there's more stuff moving. It, yeah. There's a need for it there. Right. And, and uh, it's a big deal from both uh, losses and from also the other end of the people that are desperate enough to try and steal this stuff off these trucks. So yeah. I'm going to call it big. Could make reshoring and that kind of concerns a little bit more. Yeah, it certainly does. Certainly does. Big deal, little deal here. Around 8.45 a.m. on Friday, I know if you missed this, this was massive. Ten truckers, yes, ten, brought Interstate 5 in Glendale to a full stop. Here's a video. Wow. Check it out. Uh, is it a big deal? Yeah, it is, because you have a lot of pressures going on, and we yes, know what do. happens with drivers and everything. I think we're going to – and this isn't the first protest that's happened no. since the decline. There's one in mm -mm. Florida – a couple weeks ago. Mm -mm. Again, only 10 here, but look, it, it shut down traffic. 10 is not uh, indicative of an entire industry. But um, I think it's something to watch because we're going to see more and more of this, and not just truck drivers, just regular American people. If uh, they can't start affording stuff, business owners, they can't start affording stuff. People are going to take people are going to take to the streets. Um, Agreed. Is it that bad yet? Maybe not. But uh, the warning signs are there, and as the market goes down, you'll see more and more of this. So not not a huge deal yet, but something definitely to keep uh, your eyes on. Uh, by the way, Rooster has a story on backthetruckup.com. Go over to backthetruckup.com. It is live now. Now here's one for you: a California ah. woman. She dropped her phone oh, in an no. outhouse, right? <laughs> uh, so the uh, police states, right? It says, <laughs> says this lady, she was in, she was at Mountain Walker near the North parking lot. She's a lady in her 40s. She's trying to call somebody. 
Her phone falls in. She tries to dismantle like the toilet seat. She still can't reach it. So she has her dog leash. And through her dog leash, she tries to make herself like a makeshift harness. And I think we have a picture of the outhouse too. So people can see what she fell into. Uh, They, she had the harness attached to her leash to like lower her own self in. And then she just fell straight. She like, it it could not support her weight. She fell straight into the toilet head first. She got (laughs) trapped down there. Fortunately, her phone fell in before her. So she actually was able to grab her phone. I don't know, brush it off. Maybe she had a wet nap with her. So it was floating on top of I, I something. Had some Purell, uh, you know. yeah, yeah. She pulled it out the diaper. She's dialing 911. She's talking it with it up to her ear after it was in the poo. And she's like, I need help. So they eventually they get there. It took like 15, 20 minutes to get her out of there. Um, no. uh, it was <laughs> it was Britain no. Fire Department and Rescue. They took her out, right? And she, they said that, you know, do you want medical aid? And she said, I refuse medical aid. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure she did. And the guy said, the sheriff said, it's a wonder she didn't die from the toxic you was yeah. within there. It's the methane can steal the oxygen. I mean, actually, you can die right in there. It's a big deal. Little bit. Did you ask your phone? No, that's a hard no for me. I ain't going. But, you know, whoever made that phone, great advertising. Right off. Why doesn't Apple make that in a new commercial? I don't can know. Can survive I do, at the top of Mount, like, well, Mount Rainier, wherever the hell this was. Water resistance. It I'll give you water resistance. Hey, on Twitter, ask if you do provide him at Vince and the Dude. Subscribe to What the Truck, wherever you get your podcasts from. Uh, don't be a stranger and tell him how to be. Hey, peace and love. Spread it everywhere. <laughs>